Ed DeRosa with you at HRNHQ, ready to dish with the Prince, the Paddock Prince up in Oldham County, and as always, giving out winners at Aqueduct and Churchill Downs. David, we are a couple weeks removed from the Breeders' Cup. The action still goes strong through the end of the year. We have the Clark, Grade 1, Cigar Mile. The bigger question, though, is who's going to show up? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually saw in the notes today that Darren put out for Churchill that Rich Strike may, may be making an appearance, and if he does make an appearance... He, if, we, if he wins the race, he's got to win the race. He would be three old champion in my estimation, but I that's agree. to be determined. If someone, he, if someone with a vote, he would he would win it with the win in the Clark. Absolutely, I agree. But if you go through the older horse division, I mean, I literally have no clue who's left. I mean, the Cigar Mile has a few horses like Zandin and Mind Control that are probable, okay. but in the, as long as the Clark, I have no idea who's going to show up in that race. He would probably yeah, sure Cox. Will have, is he around? No, I think he re- did. He, I think he retired too. Uh, I guess I should look. But there's so the many horses. The conversations think, we're winging it. There better be a lot of females out there. That's all I know because there's a lot of male horses retiring. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially with the size of these books. Uh, you know, now Lane's End they they're pretty judicious. Um, I would expect Flight Line to be in the the 150 to 200 range. Uh, but any new stallion that's at Spendthrift is going to be good for 200 plus mares. Uh, really puts the squeeze on you know those sires that may be struggling in their third, fourth, fifth year. And uh, you were telling me, uh, I guess coaches go through a similar cycle that uh, U of L, which not the greatest to starts, but the leash is a little long for coaches because they have to get time to sort of develop their program. And sires are similar because they cover mares. And then they don't have anything at the track for a few years. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing when a coach takes over, like at UofL, you know, these aren't really his guys. Next year, he'll get some of his guys to come in. And then the year after, when he's got kind of his culture and all his players, that'll kind of be the year where we'll really have to start producing. And it's kind of the same with sires, you know, like American Pharaoh. He's got this thing that he's a turf sire. So the first, you know, the first couple of years, he kind of, he started to do okay, I guess, but you know, as sires along the lines, I would definitely say after a year, after probably two years is when you start to, you know, their second or third crop is when you really start to find out what kind of sire they're going to be. Right. And that's a great time to gamble on them if you're a breeder, because uh, usually there's, so I've heard, I have never bred a horse, but deals and uh, farms are willing to work with, with breeders to keep those books somewhat full for those third and fourth year sires that have horses just coming to the track. Everyone likes the new and shiny. We certainly see that on the Triple Crown Trail. Uh, but Rich Strike, uh, everything old can be new again. I agree with you. If you were to win the Clark, and I, I'm very uh, agnostic when it comes to who was in the race for year-end championships. To me, if you're the one showing up and you win, that counts as you won the race. Yes, 100%. And I'm not – obviously, Epicenter got hurt in the Classic, so it would be between him or – so you can't hold that race against – you can't hold that race against Epicenter. But, you know, he did beat him in the Derby, and then Epicenter beat him in the Travers. But, I mean, if you win the Clark, that would be another grade one for um, Rich Strike. And he beat older horses. I don't know. Obviously, it's not going to be – a. it's a grade one race, but it's not going to be a grade one quality field this year. But, yeah, I agree with you. Um, But on the stud thing, would you – I was talking about this to somebody the other day. Wouldn't you rather pay – 200,000 for a sire that's already set in stone that you know what you might get instead or would you rather pay 200,000 for fly line for the possibility no I'd rather the set in stone and the reason why number one for the reason you sort of alluded to you already know that there's success possible uh, so that's been established but number two I feel like at this stage in the breeding game and the the sales game down the road after you actually have a full is it, to me, there's a, a finite amount of money to be spent. And having the best flight line may be the sale topper, but the most you're going to do is, let's say, $2 million for a sale topping yearling. So it's not like you're getting an extra boost on your gamble, whereas the best into mischief is going to be seven figures, the best tap at seven figures, the best curling, et cetera. So you have the benefit of knowing that they're capable of getting those type of horses and the seven figure carrot, whereas flight line, you can only do as well as the horses that already have success. So 
If I had 200, yeah, 000, and the horse is like, I'd probably choose to gamble it instead of breed. But if I had to breed, yeah, yeah. Me too, I'd, me go too. To, I'd go to tap it. Well, I was also talking to someone the other day, like Flightline and the Jack Christopher's world. They're a little fragile. So, you know, I mean, obviously they only ran five or six times. So it's going to be a big, I know Jack Christopher's only 45,000, I think. But, you know, Flightline, if he's 200,000, it's a little yeah. bit of a risk. But I guess all of us are a risk in general. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're a pin hooker, I could see where you might have a little more upside with like a Jack Christopher or a flight line. Cause you, you know, maybe get a yearling that you think, Oh, this horse can grow into its body. And then as a two year old, I mean, if you get that flashy work by flight line, first crop, I would say, yeah, that the, the sky is maybe a little more limitless there versus an established sire. But even then you're only talking, you know, I throw this number around like it's not big, but to these people, it's just, that's the numbers they operate in a few hundred thousand dollars. And I, I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure that reward is worth the risk when, like you said, the others are so ready made at this point. I mean, it, it's incredible. The numbers into mischief and tap it every year put out with their Early. racehorses. Yeah. And, and there's so many, I, I don't, I, I could be wrong about this. This might be the best. I mean, the, all these, what you got Olympia life is good. Flight line, Jack Christopher, I'm sure I'm forgetting others, but there's just so many good horses that are going yeah. in the stud this year. So it's going to be interesting to see how they spread it out amongst and with, with the all right, the ones that are setting stuff with the right breeding. I forget who Olympiads by, but, um, you know, a horse Bites like, down? is he okay? Which he's, he's fine. Um, I don't know. I think it sounds like I could be dead wrong about that, but I feel like it's We have the technology. Let's see. Yeah, we do. I'm sure somebody's going to correct me even here. Spikes Town. Well done. Wow. See, now nobody can correct me on the comments page on the when this Very video well goes done. up. That and I would wrong. say a grade winning, grade one winning son of Spikes Town at a mile and a quarter and runner up in the classic, also a mile and a quarter. Uh, that's. To me, that's a lot of brilliance for that tire line. So, uh, and he's thirty five thousand. Yeah, Olympia was a very good horse. Yeah, yeah, so, Olympia yeah, was a very good horse. I mean, there. he ran, he ran, yeah, he ran nine uh, races this year, and I think he only eight races. Maybe he ran one bad race. Right. So he's no, very durable, uh, and he ran. I, mean, I thought he ran all the way. From, I thought his Foster was the best older male race outside of Flight Line. Yeah, no, his foster was fantastic. He put away American Revolution like a claimer, and they were both right. really running in the lane. So, yeah, that, right. he was um, – I forgot about American Revolution. What happened to him? That's another older horse. I don't even know New what York happened. Red. He'll be back somewhere. He will. He will. Well, uh, another hot topic this week is uh, we, we are starved for some racing content, which we'll have next week, Stars of Tomorrow 2 and the Clark and all that good stuff. and. Uh, then the week after Cigar, or two weeks after the Cigar and Remsen, Demoiselle. Uh, but announcer is a very hot topic. My good friend, Ray Catolo of Harness Land fame, called the races last night at Rosecroft. Parks has a new announcer, Jessica Paquette. Uh, neither, I would say, has joined the pantheon of the best of the best currently, which is why I'm going to ask you, who is your favorite announcer going right now? Okay, this is going to be a two-part answer for me because <laughs> I have to answer this. You know, this is a two-part answer. I Travis know, there's, Stone, there's politics involved. Travis Stone's the best announcer, but my – I don't want to say my favorite. The one that – I, I don't know how to use the right adjective. It intrigues me the most is Pete Aiello at Gulfstream. I don't know why. He just really <laughs> – like he like he makes like a 12-5 claimer an exciting race. But I would – and, uh, you know, it is weird though. I can't imagine Pete Aiello at another track. It just when you think of him, you just think of Gulfstream. But – I would probably have to go, yeah, Travis and Pete Aiello, but yeah, I mean yeah, they're both Pete, very. Uh, I don't, I don't think we realized how good we had it in Ohio when he was at Belterra, which may have been River Downs when he was there. Um, Did he go to then, Oaklawn? Then he went to Oaklawn, yep, and then uh, got the, the. I think he was filling in at Gulfstream, and then got the full time gig. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was Larry who had it full time and left with with the iteration. It was there. Yeah, it was Larry. It was Larry, it was, yeah. like, Larry went to. And then he went to Churchill, and then he went to Naira. That's right. So, yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, I agree on Travis. And I'll, I'll shout out to another uh, guy who's plied his trade in Ohio before and who starts this weekend at Fairgrounds, not 
starts his career there, but starts to me. It's been there for a long time. But John G. Dooley uh, was the voice for me growing up. And uh, I just, to me, he feels like an MC, uh, which is why I think he really worked at Arlington, which was a park that uh, had a live crowd and, you know, just did a lot for the live racing scene more than simulcast. And John always, to me, just sort of had that presence of sort of leading the, the proceedings during the day. And, and I, I think he calls a good race, too. So uh, shout out John G., who was at Horseshoe Indianapolis this summer. But looking forward to him back down in the bayou. But, uh, yes, we are after several years of um, others at Churchill. Uh, very, very happy to have Travis at our home track. Yeah, and I'd be failed. I think Paul Espinosa is a good announcer at Charleston yes, as well. Better call I think, Paul. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, no, if there's a next big opening or, you know, a track a little more upscale than where he's at, I would think he would be a good fit for a track because I think he's also a really good announcer. Yep. No, there's, uh, there, and it, it's easy, you know, we get so lost into playing our circuits and such. Uh, and I'm not going to start naming because then I'll, leave off people that I think are really good, but I do encourage people to, you know, pop on a replay every now and then, or between races, check out a different track. Cause I'm always fascinated by the, the flair and the, the different styles that these announcers bring to the mic. And uh, it's, you know, not, an, not an easy gig. Um, so it, it's kind of cool to appreciate what they do uh, from up in the stands, but uh, yeah, John G this weekend, uh, Travis ongoing now, uh, this will be out long after the day's proceedings, but I know you and I are both out for revenge after getting bumped in the early pick five. Yeah, I'm going to have definitely have to take a late look at the late pick five, but we were just trying to beat a chalk. So, right. Yeah. But, you know, you know, and I think with track announcers too, like Pete Isle reminds me of Goldstream, really good. Travis is really good here with the Derby and everything. And I think track announcers, you get used to them. Now, Naira's going to be a little difficult because they have about, they're going to be playing roulette at their track announcers. <laughs> not going to always be calling specific day but that's one track that i don't know what's going on with their track announcers but back in the day they had tom durkin and it was set in stone that it was tom durkin now it's a bunch of people yep yeah they're rotating uh chris griffin I'm not sure when he takes over um soon though at when, i think after the cigar mile and then Embry Hall's the only calling belmont Right. And then Frank Miramati is calling Saratoga. And then it goes back to Belmont. And then it goes back to Peter Griff. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Chris. And Stabile might get it. Not the family team. guy. Stabile. Yeah. Yeah. Anthony. Don't the, forget. I would guess the backup every now and then as needed. No, he would be the backups, backup, backups, backup. <laughs> well, yeah. We all look forward to his picks, or at least we look forward to his arguments on the desk. I, I know uh, our good friend at Churchill, Gary P., loves a spirited debate among the handicappers, so uh, he does provide that. Uh, hopefully you'll provide some winners. We have the scroll picks at horseracingnation.com. Uh, are you doing any Domar? I know they have maybe one big stakes day later yeah. in the week. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm just going to do Domars on the weekend for the most part, and then they okay. have that big closing – the last two weekends of the Del Mar meet are really good. They have the grade one for really the boys, good. the American turf. They have, um, they have the couple long distance, the Rodeo drive. I think it is. They have a couple long distance Philly and Mayor races. So yeah, they have a Johnny V's out there. Flavian went back out there. So the racing is pretty good on the weekends at Del Mar, especially the last two weeks. So I'll be doing that. And then in about a month's time, we'll have Goldstream championship meet championship meet. Yeah. The, uh, the, the jockey colony out there, uh, between Johnny V, Juan, and Flavian, and you know some guys that are maybe better in California than when they ship east, uh, like Umberto, uh, pretty strong. No, no, it's, it has gotten better. Ramon Vasquez has done well there. There's a, yep. you know, then you have the guys like Ken Desor Ken Desormo is back this weekend. Yes, uh, don't know how many win. Don't know how many wins so good, but he's back. Yeah, uh, he is back. All right, well, I, I'll leave that at that, uh, and we'll leave everyone else to pay attention to that scroll to get your picks. We'll be back next week. Uh, have your list of what you're thankful for. I will. I'm going to – next week's a fun week. There's a lot to be thankful for yeah. next week. I'm no, looking forward to uh, Thanksgiving. My, my the best holiday. Week of the year. Yep. Absolutely. 100%. Me too. It's the best holiday. Yeah. 100%. No debates. We get to watch the Lions and the Packers and the Bears <laughs> playing football on Thursday every year, and then we get some good racing. Yep, and you know, don't have to worry about gifts or any of that. You show up with a plate of food and at the races, it's all you need to do. You like pumpkin pie? Uh, I don't, I don't love it, but 
I'll have it with some whipped cream. Yeah, it's extremely overrated. I'm just making yeah. sure we're on the same page. No, we are. Yeah. I do like it better than sweet potato pie. Uh, I don't eat sweet potato pie. That doesn't, That's not me either. <laughs> All right. Well, more on our favorite Thanksgiving dishes when we dish next week. But that's it for this week. Good luck.